Hey everybody, my name's Alex. Hey, I'm Josh. My name's Key. I work at a cryptocurrency called Oxen, doing everything from writing tweets to editing white papers. I'm the CTO at Oxen. I'm the CMO here at Oxen, and I'll be explaining proof of stake to you guys at a beginner level. I'm going to be explaining proof of stake at an intermediate level. Today I'm going to be explaining proof of stake at an expert level. Okay, so imagine that you have a large group of your friends together and you have to try and decide on where you're going to go for lunch. Now, there are many methods you can use to try and come to an agreement, but you have to try and use a method to come to an agreement. Proof of stake is just one of the methods that strangers on the internet can use to try and come to an agreement on something. So the reason it's called stake is because each different individual is gonna have to put aside some money to stake a claim on their right to vote to be a part of that agreement process. When the participants of a blockchain verify a transaction and add it to the chain, we call that achieving consensus. But we need some kind of method or set of rules that actually allow us to do that, which is called the consensus mechanism. Proof of stake is the consensus mechanism, which says that people who are holding the cryptocurrency can probably be trusted to verify, add blocks, and overall protect the integrity and security of the blockchain. Now you can't just hold and own the cryptocurrency, you need to do something more with it. You need to lock or stake your cryptocurrency which signals to everybody that you can be trusted, you have skin in the game and you are prepared to do the heavy lifting and secure the blockchain. Now once you've locked those coins up, then you're going to be responsible for verifying transactions and adding them to the blockchain. And when you do that, you're going to be awarded with some kind of cryptocurrency reward that incentivizes good behavior. But if you do the wrong thing, then you can be punished as well. You're likely to get kicked off the network, which means that although your coins are still going to be locked and you don't have access to spend or transfer them, you're no longer going to be eligible to earn rewards. So generally, proof of stake has uh, several types of implementations. Generally, what you're looking at when you're looking at a proof of stake implementation is a bunch of different modules that are added together um, to make up an enti the entirety of a proof of stake system. So one of the more important modules is how you select the next block proposer who is going to create a block in the system. There's several ways of doing this. Some of the early systems would, have, would use um, coin uh, weighted voting where essentially you have an amount of coins and you stake it for a longer period of time and the longer that you've staked it in the system the higher your vote is worth um, and the more likelihood you'll have to create another another block as well so we saw peer coin um, very early on using this system. The, the, the systems that we've evolved now are actually more related towards uh, randomly selecting the next block proposer. So Ethereum uses a system called RANDAO to combine the randomness of a bunch of different validators to choose the next um, block proposer or validator. So that's one of the methods and Oxen uses a similar system as well. Uh, so maybe once you've had, once you've got the rules for creating a new block, you might want to have rules as well for uh, selecting different forks of the chain. Um, what happens here is um, most people would be familiar maybe with Nakamoto consensus, which is the consensus mechanism used in proof of work, which is basically that the longest chain or the chain with the most difficulty more accurately is the chain that new uh, blocks would be, be built upon by default by clients. Um, that fork choice d rule doesn't work um, in proof of stake chains because you don't necessarily have the idea of difficulty like you do in proof of work systems. So what you do instead is, you, um, well Ethereum specifically has rules um, that count more towards uh, finalization of particular blocks so after a certain amount of time or a certain amount of blocks in the Ethereum um, chain, you'll have a point at which um, the nodes will finalize a block. So the, the new blocks have to be built on that historical chain. You cannot choose a new um, like core block to start building from. Um, so that's one of them. And then they also use an algorithm called Ghost as well to decide how to build blocks in that intermediate um, stage as well bef um, before finalization has happened. Then you may have systems like timing rules, which particularly look at, uh, for example, if a particular block proposal was chosen to propose a block um, in a period of time, what should we do if that block proposer doesn't come along and propose a block? Is there a secondary block proposer that we should go to? Should we 
uh, re like vote in the system for who the next block proposer is going to be should we do the randomness process again different protocols have different um, assumptions when it comes to that um, in ethereum they have a pretty simple system where you're required to have 32 ethereum um, to start a validator and they have a process where you put that in a smart contract and it's locked up for a period of time the period of time is not set it depends on how many people are exiting the network at the same time whether you can actually get your stake out um, but then there's several rules that will apply to you as a validator as well depending on the actions that you make so um, normal validators who are acting honestly in the system will earn rewards from uh, being a validator and this is similar to mining rewards and proof of work but they also have conditions put on them that can lead to the slashing of their uh, those funds that they put in that contract when they um, created their validator. So another interesting difference between proof of work and proof of stake is how lockup works. If you're in a proof of work system, miners can essentially stop uh, mining whenever they want and that um, essentially is the end of their contribution to the chain. But in proof of, uh, in proof of stake, you actually have lockups on, on in particular validator systems. So service nodes in Oxen can exit every 30 days. So when you, when you make your initial contribution, you've got essentially a timer, which is going for 30 days until you can exit um, after that period in time. Um, so yeah, different systems will use different lockup periods and have different uh, economic ideas about how to um, keep validators incentivized in the system. Thanks guys for watching. Uh, that was the expert level of proof of stake explained by me. Um, obviously it's not covering everything. The people will be writing books on different proof of stake systems and there's papers and papers worth of uh, information out there if you want to find out more. Uh, but thanks guys for listening.